Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Seppel and I am Senior Legal Counsel with Payments Canada. I am, more importantly, extremely excited to be here today as moderator for what I know will be a fascinating set of presentations by the panel in front of you. If you are interested in payments, payment trends, not only in Canada, but abroad as well, and let's face it, who is not interested in those things here at this, this summit, um, and in particular, what experts like our panelists have to say about the pandemic and their observations, then you are in the right place. Our three panelists here are Shay and Tu, Research Director Canada with F RFI Group, Angelica Velta, Senior Economist of the Bank of Canada, and Stephen Yun, Senior Analyst, Market Insights with Payments Canada. We'll start off our session today with presentations from each of the panelists. Uh, please do feel free to submit your burning questions, which I know you'll have uh, as you have them into the, into the chat. We will reserve time at the end to tackle as many as we can. So we're going to start off with Stephen, who will share some insights specific to Canadian payment trends uh, before turning to Angelica, who will do a bit of a double click thing on cash transactions and the impact of COVID-19. And then finally, we'll turn to Shayan, who will wrap up the presentation portion by speaking to global trends. And we'll share some observations, I believe, about uh, mobile wallets and also fintechs. So I see we've pulled up the slides here. And we'll turn it right over to Stephen without further ado. Thanks very much, Sarah, and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much for joining this afternoon's breakout session. So I'll be taking everybody through the key highlights from this Canadian payments methods and transport. So each year, Payments Canada provides an overview of the payment transport in Canada through the publication of this report, which we generally provide in the fall. So this will be sort of like a sneak preview of what's to come. Now, the main objective of the report really is just to provide a holistic view of the payments market in Canada over the past year. And what we do is we try to compare trends. So we look at this year's uh, market activity versus the previous years, and we also look at longer term trends in the report. The report, as Sarah mentioned here, will squarely focus on the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the Canadian payments market. And one thing I do want to mention is that the findings I'll be sharing with you today is based in part on payments data that we collect internally through our systems, market research surveys, as well as consultation with payments experts as, and other industry sources. So with that, let's move on to the next slide, please. So I want to begin, first of all, by providing an overview of the payments landscape. In 2020, Canadians made a total of 20 billion payments actions worth $9.4 trillion. Now, I know, as everybody can imagine, this past year has not been an ordinary one because of the pandemic. Um, during this past year, we've seen a lot of things happening. Businesses being forced to shut down, many Canadians losing their jobs. We were subjected to emergency stay-at-home orders and social distancing and staying within your bubble became sort of the routine. So a result of this, all, all this trial, uh, basically overall confidence and spending took a hit. And we saw that reflected in the total payments market in Canada, which actually contracted slightly due to this decreased economic activity. But what I wanted to tell you is that a big picture over the longer term, uh, what we're seeing is that total payment market uh, trends remain unchanged and in some ways uh, has been accelerated by the effects of the pandemic. So what I'd like to do, first of all, is just have your attention focus on the left side of the screen where we talk about volume. I want to say, first of all, what we're seeing is that credit and debit cards continue to compete closely to our leadership of overall share of volume. Uh, so what we're seeing is that uh, usage continues to grow in this respect. Uh, we're also seeing that cash continues to, to decline, uh, even though uh, it's still within the top three, it's continued its downward trend and usage continues to decline. And in many ways, this has been accelerated by the effects of the pandemic, as I mentioned. Check usage uh, can account for a very small share of volume. It also can, continues to decline. But one thing I do want to point out is, is that on transfers continues to show very impressive growth. Uh, and in fact, when you look at the past five year period, and this is not, a, uh, I guess, a misprint, is you're seeing that uh, it grew by 569%. So that's staggering. It's 
really, really impressive growth. And Interact e-transfers is pretty much leading the way, more so this year than in the past as well. If we look over to the right side of the slide and focus now on value of payments, what we're seeing is um, electronic funds transfers and checks dominating this space. And here it's sort of a story of opposites where we see electronic funds transfers continue to grow, but check uh, declining. Now, check still remains a, a pretty popular payment method for uh, Canadians. And in particular, it's, it's really driven both e EFT and check usage by businesses in Canada. Um, I like to, for a minute, just focus on checks alone. Even though check usage is doing, businesses continue to use checks really for a couple of reasons. Uh, for the, a lot of the vendors uh, prefer check payment, sending and receiving payments. So it's uh, a course of or function of suppliers. And number two, um, checks basically are favored by businesses just because it's easier for reconciliation. Uh, so by that, I mean, when payments are made, uh, it's easier to reconcile payments because checks allow businesses to attach information along with the check payment station that you might find in an invoice. Uh, so that's easier to understand uh, what the checks uh, payments are being made for. Uh, whereas with electronic payments, that's not uh, possible as of yet. Uh, you can't attach as much information as you would be able to with checks. One other thing I want to point to your attention is that uh, with businesses and their use of EFT and check, uh, one striking feature you see between these two pie charts is just that uh, with checks and EFTs, even though the account lower share of volume, their values are much higher just because even though we're dealing with uh, the number of transactions being less, the actual average transaction values are much higher. And just to give you an idea, larger we're dealing with large companies here and transferring large payments. So that's the reason why you're seeing much larger values uh, between checks and EFTs. So let's move to the next slide, please. So I talked about longer term payment trends. Uh, here, we're just showing the past five year transaction trends uh, and what they, and this visually gives you a better idea of the changes that we're seeing take place. So I mentioned when we looked about we look volume that credit cards and debit cards continue to dominate this space. You can clearly see that uh, over the past five years, they've continued to lead all other payment types in terms of overall share of volume. And for the first time, we saw that credit cards overtook debit cards sometime between 2018 to 2019. Uh, what we're also seeing is a slight dip in overall um, volume over the past year. So you see uh, both credit cards and debit cards dip slightly. Now, that's not because Canadians stopped using, uh, or it fell out of favor that they stopped using uh, credit cards and debit cards. It's more a reflection of the fact that there's decreased spending due to the effects of the pandemic. Uh, under a normal year, pre-pandemic, uh, we would expect credit cards and debit cards to have continued growing. And the reason why credit cards are favored over debit cards, uh, consumers, Canadians, frequently use credit cards more often than uh, debit cards just because uh, the, the rewards, uh, the loyalty points, the cashback that they receive when purchases using credit cards. Now, looking at the cash trend, you can see that uh, over the past year has continued to decline. And again, that's been accelerated by the pandemics, the effects of the pandemic, which I'll speak about shortly. Uh, but what's more important to notice here is that the overall trend for cash usage has been on the decline for quite some time now. And I think in large part due to the fact of uh, uh, list payments, the rise of contactless payments, as we've seen in the past, uh, debit flex introduction has taken a real bite out of uh, low value transactions made by cash typically. Um, the reason for that is that people no longer need to insert their card into a reader and enter a PIN. Uh, they ne merely just need to tap and pay. So the payment process is much faster, more convenient, and it's much easier than uh, using cash for everyday purchases. So for such things as buying a cup of coffee or buying items at a convenience store or a stand. So contactless payments definitely started getting more use because of Interact Flash. And we're seeing them also appear for other providers such as uh, Master, MasterCard, uh, <clears throat> MasterCard and V with their contactless uh, capabilities. Now I'd like to just quickly turn to value 
and focus on that for a minute. Here we're seeing electronic fund transfers continue to grow, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, but we're also seeing checks continue to decline. With electronic transfer, you did see sort of a slight plateauing this year, and that's because of the COVID-19 crisis as businesses were shutting down and economic economic activity decrease, basically payment activity decrease as a result. So there was a flattening of the curve. And as I mentioned before with checks, it continues to decline, but it still is a going concern among businesses. Uh, they like using checks for the reasons I explained before, because uh, reconciliation is easier for payments. And the fact that a lot of suppliers still prefer checks for sending and receiving payments. I do think uh, in the coming years as uh, our RTR Live and the promise of ISO 20022 and data rich payments, you're probably going to see um, more businesses going away from more towards electronic fund transfers, just for the very reasons that I described that with ISO 20022 messaging standards, you're going to have data rich payments and the ability to attach more payment information when making payments. So that solves a problem of the reconciliation issues that I uh, discussed earlier. So that will in a long uh, way impact uh, the ongoing use of checks, probably make more businesses likely to move over to EFTs. So let's move to the next slide, please. I want to explore the impact of the pandemic on payment attitudes and behavior in 2020. So we basically tracked uh, consumers and businesses' attitudes over time during the course of the pandemic. And what we noticed were there were three main impacts of the pandemic on overall Canadians' payments behavior. Number one, we have that overall consumer spending decline due to the lockdown and emergency stay-at-home order. So as you can imagine, you know, not being able to go to stores, not knowing how long the lockdown is going to last, it decrease uh, consumers' appetite to make purchases. Uh, we did see, however, that through the course of the year, consumer spending began to rebound, and that's reflected in terms of their attitudes about their spending as well. And this was brought on by several reasons. I think, first of all, once government emergency benefits responses such as CERB and the employee wage subsidy benefits kicked in, that definitely helped uh, spark or stimulate the economy. Uh, we also saw an uptick in consumer confidence around July and August with the announcement by Moderna and Pfizer with the successful clinical trials of their COVID-19 vaccine. So again, there, that created some encouragement and uplifted consumers' confidence about maybe the end of the pandemic is nearing. And we also saw the reopening of the economy in many parts of Canada between May and October. So again, that highlighted the economy and got people to start spending a little bit more. But I think overall, uh, people were still cautious about their overall spending due to the uncertainty about how, how long the pandemic will last because this was an unintended event. And nobody really knew exactly, you know, how long it would take before we're really out of the woods. The second main impact of the pandemic on Canadians' payments behavior was the rise in con contactless payments use. So we know that the pandemic concerns about people handling cash and touching cart readers at the point of sale. And as a result, Canadians are using ATMs less often. So they basically were uh, withdrawing less cash. Uh, they weren't using cash as often as they did before. They started to avoid shopping at places that didn't accept contactless payments, again, for fear of uh, catching the virus just through touch and spread of the virus that way. And they also avoided going over the amount limit allowed for contactless payments. So people were doing this just having to touch the cart reader and to purchase so they really did not want to go over their contacts contactless payments and that in many ways might explain why overall spending was also on the decline in this past year because of that reason and i think that was somewhat mitigated by the fact that the credit card providers mastercard and visa decided to increase their uh, limit from $100, $100 to $200, $250 for contactless uh, payments. And a third main impact that was from the pandemic on Canadian payments behavior was an increase in e-commerce purchases. What well, we said that Canadians were buying a variety of products online more often than before. And as online purchases uh, ramped up uh, during the course of the year, what we saw that what was really interesting is that even after the economy reopened during the summer and early fall, uh, e-commerce activity continued to be quite strong, uh, which suggests that 
a lot of Canadians stayed using and prefer e-commerce uh, e for their purchases. If we, next slide, please. And what we also noticed was that impacts were reflected in the payment methods used by Canadians. So Canadians were using less cash since the start of the pandemic. Um, what we did see, however, was that there was an initial spike in cash withdrawals at the start of the pandemic, but Canadians weren't using this cash for payments per se. What they were doing instead was using cash as a hedge and a store of value. So what I mean by that was people were essentially sitting a pile of cash stashed away at home in case of an emergency. So you can imagine during times of crises or uncertainty, people uh, basically want uh, some form of stable asset that they can turn to uh, that's kept safely, that they can basically rely upon in case they need it at any point in time during the emergency. And that's what, that's what was happening at the start of the pandemic with the cash usage. Now, as people switched away from cash and more to contactless payments and making more online purchases uh, as the pandemic ramped up, what we saw was that they were using debit and credit cards and PayPal more to make these purchases. And another thing that we saw that was very interesting was that Interact e-transfer usage also began to increase uh, for P2P transfers. And what was most interesting of all was the pandemic brought upon uh, the creation of new use cases for Interact e-transfers. So some examples that I can think of would be people splitting grocery bills and big box store purchases more often than before before the start of the pandemic. People were also using interact transfers to send financial support to family members and neighbors. So that we knew that we had never seen before, uh, before the start of the pandemic. So if we move to the next slide, please. We talked about uh, two of the three main impacts of the pandemic on Canadians' payments behavior had to do with contactless usage and e-commerce. So for this next slide, I'd like to delve a little bit deeper and focus on contactless usage. So uh, as you can see from this graphic, uh, contactless usage over time has increased, but the pandemic uh, helped to boost that. Now, having said that, you can see that there was a slight flattening of the volume curve for overall contactless usage uh, between 2020 and 2019. Now, that's more a reflection of the fact that uh, because of overall decreased spending among consumers, uh, we saw that uh, the total number of credit card contactless payments declined just slightly year over year. So while more people were actually making contact payments at the store, the pandemic ramped up, uh, this increase was slightly offset by the overall consumer spending. And that's due to lockdown measures and business store closures and also decreased consumer confidence and in the economy as well as uh, their personal finances. What we did see, however, was a slightly larger increase in value of uh, contactless payments. So Canadians were still buying and uh, stocking up on essential items. And I think everybody can remember, call around the start of the pandemic, a lot of Canadians without knowing you know, what was going on and uh, were really nervous about uh, what they were hearing in the news. They literally ran to their grocery stores and started stocking up on items such as bathroom tissue, cleaning supplies, canned goods, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and that would be expected during times of emergency and uncertainty. So this all contributed to uh, the slight uptick you saw in contactless values. One other thing that That's we- so interesting. Thank you so much for those observations. I know we all want to hear so much more about uh, what the observations that you have to say. I think we need to start to start moving into the cash portion of the presentation shortly, but I'll, I'll let you wrap up um, with a few words if you would like. Okay, absolutely, Sarah. Okay, so let's just quickly jump to uh, the key points I wanted to take. And I apologize that uh, I'm not able to share all of what I wanted to talk about with you today. So just very quickly, what to wrap up is what we saw the past year, uh, the COVID pandemic did accelerate the long-term trends that we're seeing overall in the payments in Canada. We saw the decline of cash accelerate. Uh, people were using less cash and more contactless payments. We also saw the continued decline of checks and cash. We saw the rise of contactless payments and online e-commerce purchases. Uh, and the other thing that we noticed too was the impressive continued growth of uh, online transfers, and in particular, uh, interact e-transfer. So people were using that more because of 
of increased use cases that the pandemic sparked. So all these things contributed to a very interesting and um, I would say momentous year of change for payments uh, overall. But overall, long-term trends continue as we have seen them before in the past. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it back over to Sarah, please. Thank you very much. And hopefully we can get to uh, a few of the additional comments that you had in the question portion. I'm sure our audience will be asking, asking about a lot more. But until then, let's turn it over to Angelica, who will talk about the cash and COVID impact. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so before I jump into my presentation, I just need to make a usual uh, disclaimer. Um, so while I'm a senior economist with the currency department at the Bank of Canada, uh, the views expressed in this presentation are mine and they do not represent the official views of the Bank of Canada. Uh, I'd also really want to extend the um, um, honest thank you to our partners and colleagues at Ipsos, uh, Statistics Canada, the University of Southern California and the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta for their advice and feedback. Um, and some of these results are quite fresh, um, so uh, they're preliminary and uh, subject uh, to change. And without all the, that out of the way, I think we can go to the next slide, please. So um, in this presentation, uh, we are diving to the question of what has happened to cash demand and use since onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I'll um, shed light on that from, uh, let's say, three angles. Um, the first one is uh, the cash and circulation tracked by the Bank of Canada. The second one um, comes from network data from Interac, uh, which uh, includes um, all transactions that settle through the Interac network. So both like that one, those that settle on um, within a bank, that those are on us and those that settle between banks. So I will uh, talk about um, ATM withdrawals and uh, debit card transactions. And then third, uh, I will talk about our uh, in-house consumer surveys. Um, so next slide, please. So um, what, is, uh, what do the notes in circulation tell us about uh, cash during the pandemic? So in this chart here, we, um, I'm presenting um, the actual notes in circulation um, and their value in 2018, uh, which is the light blue line, 2019, which is a green line and uh, 2020, um, the actual one, and then um, the dotted line, I'll, I'll get back to that. So uh, what you can see here is because these lines are, you know, stacked and the um, most recent year is uh, the highest is that cash in circulation overall has been uh, growing in Canada. Um, and it has been doing this uh, for quite a while now and actually been growing at a, a faster pace than uh, GDP. You also see that there are um, some uh, seasonal patterns, as you can see when you compare the uh, light blue line and the green line that we uh, generally see uh, um, notes in circulation increasing in, in uh, December um, and then uh, increasing uh, decreasing again in, in January. So uh, when you look at the navy blue line, the dark blue line, you see that with the onset of the pandemic, uh, cash in circulation starts to rise quickly. So there's this surge and we come and we compare that to the um, um, scenario where, uh, you know, if nothing had happened, if uh, trend growth had continued as in uh, previous years, which is a dotted blue line, and you can see that there is a, a really substantial surge in cash and that it has remained high. Um, however, the growth has ebbed up down a bit uh, with the lifting of the containment measures, and uh, there's, uh, but it has not uh, unbound. So, um, next slide, please. In this, Canada is not different from other economies. So, uh, what I am showing you here is the um, um, growth in the notes in circulation compared to GDP in a number of advanced economies. So, you can see that since the early 1990s, in um, the economies I show you here, the Euro area, um, Japan, the United States, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, uh, cash has been growing at a at a fast pace and generally outpacing um, the growth of GDP. And if we uh, dive a bit closer into that, then we also see that a lot of this growth is explained by um, larger uh, denomination nodes, which are, um, you know, traditionally thought of like being um, held for precautionary purposes or as a store of value. Interesting what you also see in this graph is if you go um, to these uh, vertical lines, which signif significa significant 
see, <laughs> stand for some uh, economic crisis or events. We see that, for example, during the global financial cr crisis or in its aftermath, cash demand spiked up, which, you know, supports this hypothesis that cash is a safe haven, especially in when we have low interest environments where it's relatively um, costless to hold cash. Um, so cash is uh, insurance. And um, so this figure is taking, taken from a paper by uh, two authors, Rose, Gerhard Röse and Frank Seitz, uh, who talk about cash and crisis, and they actually argue that what we've seen uh, during COVID-19 has not been a surprise uh, based on their analysis of a previous crisis. Um, next slide, please. So how do things look like, though, when we look at cash withdrawals? So we know that uh, consumers can obtain cash from a variety of sources. They can obtain it at the teller, they can obtain it from ATM as cash back at the point of sale. But um, what we know from our consumer surveys is that cash withdrawals at ATMs are the most com most commonly used way to uh, obtain cash that's then uh, used for purchases. So what I'm showing you here, the, the same um, years that you saw on the first slide. So I'm showing you the value of cash withdrawals compared to the total value of debit card purchases, which I'm going to call the cash card ratio. And you see, um, again, that the, the, um, the stacking this time is the other way around. So the light blue line here is 2018. Um, and then if you compare that 2019, the cash card ratio has actually slightly dropped from one year to the other, which, uh, you know, might reflect a uh, shift to card payments. And then um, when you look at the, the dark blue line here, um, you see that uh, with the onset of the pandemic, which is this like solid red light here, um, the cash card ratio dropped. But I think similar to what Steven said, actually, that until like about um, May or so, um, it spiked again, which could also, again, reflect a precautionary motive, and then it 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 drops um, and it stays below um, what uh, we've seen in previous years, actually significantly below that. And we so um, we actually have a paper where we also show that this cash card ratio really responds to what we call COVID shocks. So what it what happens is when let's say containment measures become more stringent, then the cash card ratio falls when things relax and become more open, then the cash card ratio increases. And from that, we also, um, so one conclusion that we drew from there is that uh, while we see this um, decrease in the cash card ratio, it's really too early to say what's going to happen in the future, because we need to um, really see what happens when the economy fully reopens. So now, how can we square those? We see notes in circulation, which is our own data, really going up. We see less withdrawals at ATMs. So there's a couple of factors that might explain that. So when you look at cash in circulation, um, some of that cash may be literally stuck because businesses have closed down and they could not go to the bank and um, and um, and deposit their banknotes. Same goes for consumers because going to the bank is kind of a, you know high contact, maybe non-essential activity. Um, so it's maybe not something that you're doing while there are restrictions in place. Um, but I think we really need to look at uh, micro data, and that's why we do our consumer surveys. Um, next slide, please. So the consumer surveys really complement this aggregate data because we have this granular data that tells us really something about consumers and transactions that where we can uh, look at. The heterogeneity, um, we can segment consumers, generate profiles of people who use cash, et cetera. And also, which is very important for the central bank, um, to understand the relationship between payment and expenditure choices, which then actually allows us to link some of that to um, our inflation measures. Um, next slide, please. So what we actually see is that cash holdings and use have bounced back in November 2020. And the great thing about our surveys is that we have data from before the pandemic. So here I'm comparing data from from up starting in August 2019, which was like well before the pandemic, up to November 2020. And what we see is that the percentage of people holding cash um, decreased at the onset of the pandemic from 84% in August to 74 in April, but it bounced back to 82 in November. And similar, the people who used cash um, 
So I don't have that number for August 2019, but it increased significantly between April 2020 and November 2020 from just 36 people in April 2020 had said that they were cash users, but 59 said in November 2020 that they're using cash. And then similarly here, I'm showing you the distribution of cash holdings. Um, so that had dipped quite a bit in July 2020, but in November 2020, it's actually quite similar to what we saw before the pandemic. So we do see some evidence that with, you know, um, you know, business reopening and restriction being lifted, cash also recovers. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, consumers also report high cash acceptance because payments always involve two parties, right? Somebody who gets paid, the business or the merchant and the consumer who makes the payment. So while in April 2020, um, only 43 said that they really hadn't seen anyone not wanting to accept cash, this in uh, in November, over half of them, I mean, 57 generally received uh, perceive cash as being universally accepted. And if you go to the right, that is consistent with that. 12% in April said they that they had like encountered the situation where they couldn't use cash and that dropped down to 9% in November 2020. So uh, cash acceptance seems to follow the same pattern as cash use and cash holdings. Um, next slide, please. And consistent with that, they actually all expect uh, cash use to continue, at least the individual cash use. So uh, here we uh, have some statistics on um, their plans to go cashless. So before the pandemic, 82% said, well, they had no plans whatsoever to use to, to go cashless. That dropped in April 2020 to 74%. But again, in November, again, 80% said uh, that uh, they continue using cash. And then also, um, if you look at the people who are already cashless on the right, so in um, August 2019, 10% said that they were already cashless. And I just want to highlight that um, there's the this is the uh, light green bar. But actually, if you look at the solid bar, which is the people who are truly cashless, so they don't use cash and they don't have cash, that's less than half. So only 4% were actually really cashless. And that increased in April 2020. So about a fifth said that they were cashless. Actually, again, only half of them were truly cashless. And then, uh, but then by November 2020, we're actually back to where we were before. So around 12% say they're cashless. Half of them are truly cashless. So I think we um, we see a rebound in cash um, overall um, by and by tracking like you know um, the cash use over the course of the pandemic and compare comparing it to our pre-pandemic patterns. Um, next slide, please. So I just have a few uh, remarks uh, before I hand it over to Sion. Um, so the recent developments in Canada are really very consistent with other advanced economies. And uh, I just want to point out that some of these economies are very cash intensive, um, so it's, such as Japan and some of the European Union uh, countries. But overall, I think uh, the patterns are, are similar and consistent. Um, cash transactions are still a very important driver of economic activity in Canada. Um, both in terms of like being used for payments, but also um, in terms of the you know the transactional uh, function that it uh, occupies. Um, and this is very important also for the Bank of Canada to understand, because for us that means looking at card transactions only uh, when we uh, try to understand the recovery of the economy. That might mean we're missing out on something, right? Because as we saw cash fell, right? So looking only at card transactions to gauge where the economy is going may actually overestimate the recovery in times when cash use is still down. But if cash recovers and transactions migrate back from car to cash, we might actually underestimate uh, how well um, the economy is doing. So this is very important for us. So, but it's still an outstanding question what the uh, pandemic has done to cash, whether this is permanent or transitory. We also um, would like to argue that it is important to have micro-level data uh, for consumers and merchants. This is a keen understanding the effects of the pandemic. There are really important distributional effects and heterogeneity in both of these populations. And we do know that the use of, for instance, credit cards is highly correlated with income. So understanding cash and access to cash and card payments is um, a very important public policy objective. So secondly, I think we would like to point out that um, on the business side, we need to understand um, 
how business closures and reopenings have affected the economy and also the demand for cash and what the relationship is with payment acceptance. Is it important now to accept cards to survive in this new environment or will it be okay to uh, be a cash only business when everything reopens? Um, next slide. I think this is the end of my presentation. Thank you everyone. Um, and uh, I will hand it over to Sion. Thanks, Angelica. Yeah, so we'll we'll go to Shayan next for our final presentation before we take some questions. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Stephen and uh, Angelica. I'll try to be as quick as possible so we have time for some Q&As. Um, next slide, please. Awesome. All right, I think it's a good time for us to take a step back and see where Canada sits um, in the global space um, compared to other markets, emerging and developing uh, developed markets. So we'll touch on where they see on certain trends we've seen in terms of impact of COVID, either directly or indirectly, um, new trends on contactless payment and also mobile wallets, and uh, briefly on the rise of uh, fintech and how they what particular areas they're playing within contactless payment and mobile wallets. Next slide. All right. So just as Steven and Angelica have said, um, um, we've seen over the years cash decline across all markets, including Canada. Um, but where we saw the most significant drop um, um, triggered by the pandemic was in 2020. And this was consistent across all markets, um, even Canada. And, and at the end of the year of 2020, some markets were already seeing a rebound of cash um, returning to either pre-pandemic levels or higher than pre-pandemic levels. Um, not to belabor the point on why that happened. A lot of, of consumers um, had to check their uh, discretionary spend, uh, became more sensitive towards hygiene and safety. Um, and, you know, just moving off from POS purchases to digital um, um, commerce. So once that all of that starts to, has started to change in recent times, we're seeing consumers go back to using cash. Um, on the other hand, with, with card payments, it's remained fairly stable across markets in terms of usage. Consumers are still using um, both digital uh, debit and credit cards, um, where we see growth um, in usage and appeal uh, in more digital forms of payment. So e-transfers, uh, mobile wallets. Um, next slide, please. And as I mentioned, while we're still see seeing people using cash, on average, globally, um, less than 20% are relying on paper um, forms of payment methods on their typical monthly um, um, expenses. Where we see the bulk of expense go through are uh, in card payments, so debit and credit cards. Um, what's interesting for Canada is they stand out on e-transfers uh, um, compared to other markets. But when we look at other Asia-Pacific markets like China, um, India, Hong Kong, there is significance in uh, the number of consumers who are relying on mobile wallets. And uh, interestingly, is the instances in which they reach out for their mobile wallets almost mirror what they use cash and card uh, transactions for. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of where and how they, they spend or use these uh, payment methods, cash is still being used for low value transactions. So we're seeing um, consumers including uh, those outside of Canada rely on cash for smaller purchases, um, retail, smaller retail stores, transportation costs, but then um, for low to mid uh, uh, value transactions, debit cards com comes to mind. It plays a significant role as it, it sort of replaces the instances where cash um, could be used, especially amongst consumers who are very sensitive to contact um, um, spending cash. Um, and then the higher the purchase, looking at online um, 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 shopping, you, you start to see consumers rely more on credit card. And this is very um, consistent with the global market, um, just as it is with uh, 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 Canadian consumers. Next slide, please. All right. And this trend moving towards uh, um, digital forms of payments is not only consistent with consumers. We're seeing businesses also report more payments, uh, making more payments online, making more, uh, receiving more payments online as a result of the pandemic. Um, on average, if you look at uh, Canada relative to the rest of the market, um, about 40% of businesses report that they've actually had to either receive or make more payments online. Um, when we ask more broadly across the market, um, where have they felt the most impact? In many cases, um, um, online uh, payments or receive, making or receiving online payments comes top uh, um, across the businesses for most of the markets. But what we see, which is significant for businesses as well as consumers is um, Asian markets are taking more leadership uh, um, positions in terms of digital adoption. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
All right, so I'll just quickly run through um, contactless payment. Um, it's, tr it's been trending upwards for a couple of years across all the markets we, we look at for our study at, um, at the RFI group, um, consistent with Canada and the rest of the markets. In, in, in 2020, we see more people taking the adoption of contactless payment. Of course, this is still um, accelerated by the pandemic where people are asking for merchants to provide services where they just tap and go. They don't have to interact or use cash or come in contact with any um, um, infections or safety issues. And, and this is where we're seeing more growth, more uh, um, players um, trying to take, take ownership within this space because consumers are, are gearing more towards this. Beyond the trigger for safety, there is also the simplicity and um, the fact that it's more convenient for, for consumers to use this method of payment. Um, if you look at the slide on the right, we're asking how appealing mobile, mobile wallets um, are. Quite understandably, more Asian markets rate this very highly. Uh, um, Canada and, and Australia, for example, lag behind the rest of the markets in terms of appeal for mobile wallets, but it's a trend that is actually coming up in um, um, the Asian markets like China, um, India, and in Hong Kong. Next slide, please. All right, so we just wanted to take a look at the top three mobile wallets providers by country because it highlights an important point. Um, when we look across this, more than 80% of uh, providers within this space are non-traditional banks. Um, I know some people might remember the history of Alipay coming into the market in a non-threatening manner, which is what we're seeing um, at this point where fintech providers are taking more ownership, more spaces within uh, mo uh, providing mobile wallets, um, which sort of raises the question, are we going to see the, the turn of uh, how Alipay, Alipay went from being an underdog to becoming a mainstream uh, um, financial service provider in the Asian market in this space? So across all of these markets, we see both emerging and developing markets. It's only about four where we see uh, traditional banks uh, are playing within this space. So like in Australia, um, you have a bank in Australia and a couple others that show the banks, but about 80%, the majority in that fact, are from fintech providers. And like I mentioned, consumers who are using this services are using them for very similar reasons as they're using cash or cards. So online shopping, um, smaller to higher purchases uh, um, um, in instances where cash or card would be what they reach out to their wallets for. If you look at the next slide, we've just looked uh, uh, to see how fintech providers uh, uh, are used across different markets. Um, and what's interesting is across the board, if you look back from 2018, it's been trending upwards. Uh, more people are coming into familiarity with the services they provide. Um, they're getting more and more interested in working with uh, fintech providers. And as we, we've seen from our data um, at the RFI group, that consumers are getting more comfortable using even digital only uh, uh, um, services. But what's keen here for Canada is what we for consumers, they're interested in you know where you, you you create data that shows that you know them and you understand them and beyond that providing um customer centric uh propositions that shows that what you're offering them is actually relevant so for credit karma um borrow well wealth simple these three brands are coming tops as the most used within the market and when you look at the propositions they have in market it's either showing uh, um, um helping consumers understand their credit um giving them position of power and control over their finance understanding what they spend um and pretty much just helping them um, navigate that space um, much more seamlessly next slide please um i think you could skip this to the next one all right so i just wanted to really finish off with this because when we look at um, traditional uh, providers and fintech uh, players, what's consistent is consumers are reaching out to fintech providers for the reason where they offer convenience, ease of use, simplicity. Uh, uh, but one thing that traditional banks still hold on to quite strongly is the, the element of trust. There is that feeling uh, of um, high integrity or perception around uh, um, uh, banks and even card scheme providers that consumers trust more. Um, when we look at how their transactional behaviors uh, um, appear in with their relationship with their traditional banks, um, more people who have fintech providers as their secondary accounts are using their main banks as their uh, as the where they lodge their income. And thereafter, the whole transaction happens using their fintech support services. So which also highlights an opportunity where um, traditional banks can start to pay attention because if you lose visibility of what your consumers do with their funds or how they spend that, that transactional behavior, it gets harder for you to upsell a product. It gets harder for you to build loyalty. Um, so it's 
an opportunity for, for um, consumers as well as businesses to offer um, each other the same services that, that they need. Next slide, please. All right, just a, a quick summary. We're seeing people using uh, um, cash um, less than they did uh, um, two years ago, um, but other than that, where the growth is happening is within contactless and digital uh, uh, payments becoming the norm for consumers. They've come to expect that things would happen quick, things would be convenient for them, and they'll have control over um, their financial uh, decisions. And we're also seeing this trend consistent in how businesses receive and make payments online. Um, there is the issue of fintech providers uh, uh, taking over the spaces for mobile wallets, and and what we think as as a group within the RFI team is rather than you know perceiving this as an absolute threat, it also presents an opportunity for um, every stakeholder within the payments ecosystem to you know provide services that would um, help enable their growth. Uh, and I think that is uh, the end of my slides. I think yes. So I'll hand back off to Sarah um, if you have any questions. Yeah, so I think we've had a few audience questions and I have uh, I have one here for you. So the first one, I'd be interested in all of your responses if you if you can. Uh, maybe we'll we'll look to Stephen first uh, on it and then turn to the to the other two. So um, the question is, what will Canadians payment behavior look like post COVID-19? Everyone wants to look forward past the end of the pandemic, right? And that includes in terms of payment trends. <laughs> so that's a very good question, Sarah. I think eventually when the COVID-19 crisis is finally behind us, uh, you're probably going to see a reset in payments behavior among Canadians. So what I mean by that is that there is going to be a return of cash use fully for low value transactions as before for some people. Uh, but you're going to see reliance on cash as a form of payment will continue to trend downwards as we've seen over the long term. Uh, I expect to also see continued growth in contactless payments and online purchases now that more Canadians have gotten used to using and seeing it throughout the pandemic. So you're hooked. Um, we are definitely going to see uh, a resurgence of payment transactions. Um, so as the economy begins to rebound and consumer confidence and spending recovers, definitely credit card transactions will increase. And then lastly, I think too, that um, contactless card, mobile wallet and interact e-transfer payments, they all saw increased usage during the pandemic. And this trend definitely will continue post COVID. And I think that's partly due to the fact that we saw expanded uses discovered by consumers and merchants payment types during the pandemic. So that will continue to evolve as more people begin to use these forms of payments. Thank you. And Angelica, Stephen mentioned cash there. And when I when I hear cash now, I will always think of you and your insights. Are you aligned with what, what Stephen was mentioning about the trends for cash post pandemic? Um, I think that our, you know, the, the, the evidence that uh, I showed from our surveys uh, supports that. I mean, we saw um, cash rebounding when uh, the restrictions loosened. Um, so overall, I think we'll um, we'll see more cash again. Whether you know, but I so whether the effects are going to go away altogether, whether it has accelerated um, what's going on before. I think to me, it's uh, still an open question. I think we also need to really carefully consider uh, the business side of it. So um, we know that. Um, so in 2015, we conducted a business survey and we showed that one third of small and medium sized businesses were not accepting uh, cards. Um, so I think we need to uh, understand what's what's happening with acceptance of cards as well. Um, and I think this will be an important puzzle piece uh, going forward, um, how the business landscape will, will evolve. Um, so I can see that maybe so some smaller businesses now with like offering curbside pickup, they have basically joined e-commerce platforms. Um, and I think it was a question that was brought up in the in the chat, but this might come at a cost for them, a cost that they are might be willing to bear right now just to stay in business. But um, we need to see how um, their um, decisions around that evolve uh, post pandemic. It's really, yeah, really interesting. And I like how you picked up on that uh, question from the other question from the chat as well. Uh, Shan, can we can we turn it over to you for your your comments on those payment trends post pandemic? What the others have mentioned? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, sir. I actually um, agree with Stephen and Angelica. Um, most of what our data shows is that 
while consumers seem to see, I know on average about 40 to 45 percent of consumers envision a cashless uh, cashless society in, in the near future, there is still that si a significant number of 60% that still think cash would be around for a while. And if you think about it, the, the reasons or the arguments for keeping cash are still valid. Um, people wanting anonymity, the low um, value spend, um, um, the fact that it's a, an acceptable currency anywhere. Um, so those are still valid. So I think there will still be instances where um, um, the situation would warrant a payment with, with cash. Um, just just another point on um, contactless, as Stephen mentioned, I think what we've seen accelerate um, contactless in the last year was safety. People were more conscious about hygiene. However, I think it will stay, stay for a much longer time simply because consumers are getting used to the fact that it is simple to use, it is convenient to use, uh, and that would be what will keep it much longer in the market. Super. Thank you very much. Okay. So I think we're close to the end of the presentation now. So before we get caught off, I think it is time for us to say thank you very much to our presenters, Stephen, Cheyenne, and Angelica for your uh, insights um, and the audience, of course, for joining us. Uh, we wish you all the very best in the rest of your day, and we encourage you to keep attending summit sessions and share your learnings with your network. So thanks so much and see you later. Thank you.